righty, all righty, all righty. We just, uh, we've been discussing, I'm just telling the people that are coming in, we've been discussing Ohio State, Michigan, and uh, the Saints, and uh, all those kind of things. I, uh, I try to stay away from wearing any, like, team shirt I used to wear. You know, before we started doing all that, I'd wear an Alabama shirt or a Mississippi State shirt or whatever. And I try to kind of stay away because I don't know where everybody might be from that might be looking at it and be like, oh, well, let's turn him off. He's, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He couldn't be spiritual. Look who he's for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, he, you know, he ain't right. Cause he, he ain't right with that. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, the good thing is that uh, we on the, we on the Lord's team. So we're going to win. We know we're going to win. And uh, these two chapters here, really the la these last four chapters are uh, just basically uh, telling us what's going to happen at the end uh, after all of the things that we've been studying in Revelation. We've seen, goodness, the church ages. We've seen the, the seals being broken, the trumpets being sounded, the vials being poured out, uh, and, and just annihilation on the earth and evil and all of the all of the the injustice of the world being solved you know that's one of the reasons uh, I, that i think uh, that that people really uh, need the lord in their lives more than anything because of all the injustice that we see happening in this crazy world we live in now you know there has to be some justice somewhere and and it, it certainly is not just now uh it seems like the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer, and it, there's a lot. Of, there are a lot of questions people have all the time about that. Why do but why do why do bad things happen to good people? Kind of deal, and why do bad people have good things that happen in their life? And of course, that's an eternal question. That's a question happened. Matter of, matter of fact, the Book of Malachi has that question in it, and uh, also Job, I think, has a lot to say about that kind of stuff. And the uh, Lord says, hey, just hang on. There's going to be a payday someday. And it's not, you know, there, they, right now it, it looks like people will skate that and they can, you know, do evil things and go their merry way. And there's no, there's no justice about that. But, of course, we come now to 19, 20, 21, and 22, and we get to see all of the justice come, come to an end. It's not real complicated for the most part. It's just... Uh, uh, there are a few things here that, that would be interesting, I think, for us to point out and see that are said in certain ways that uh, will be interesting for us. But, but I don't think anybody's going to have any trouble understanding what's happening in, in these 19, 20, 21, and 22. So um, let, me, let me just get started uh, with chapter 19 and verse 1. After these things, it, it, it's, it's amazing how John kind of keeps that chronology going. A lot of times, after these things, I saw. Uh, just trying to tell us, uh, basically keep us informed that these are things that the Lord is showing him, that he's not just tripped out into some fantasy thing or, 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 uh, is, or drug abuse or, or mushrooms or whatever it might be. It's not a bad trip that he's seeing. He's saying that uh, the Lord has taken me just sequentially through these things. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in, in heaven saying, Alleluia. Now, I put in your notes that uh, this word Alleluia is the Greek form of a Hebrew word, Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah is, this, this is the only place, this is the only chapter or the only, and the only place in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, where the word Hallelujah is said. It's said quite a bit in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, this, this is the only one. And uh, hallelujah means, uh, well, let me start this way with it. In the Hebrew language, there are seven words for praise. Uh, Toda, yada, barak, shabak, halal, zamar, and tahiyah. Those are the seven words that are used for praise, and, and, they're, and, and they mean different things. Toda means to dance before the Lord. Uh, uh, yada means to lift your hands and praise the Lord. Uh, Barak means to bow before him and praise him. Zamar is to praise him on an instrument. And Tahiya means, if I've forgotten anything, just this covers it. Tahiya <laughs> covers everything. But Halal 
halal means to dance a jig, like to just be euphorically happy, dance, like just cut loose, dance a jig. And so the word hallelujah is a combination of the, of the word halal, which means to dance a jig before the Lord and just be beside yourself and just let it go and don't worry about how you look or whatever. Just be happy before the Lord. And then the yah part is when God, when Moses asked God his name, you know, he said, all right, who shall I say sent me? Because he, God was sending him to Egypt to, to go before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And Moses said, okay, uh, that's good. But when he asked me, who, who, who it is that sent me, who, what am I going to say to him? In other words, what is your name? And God says, my name is I am. You just tell him I am sent you. Now, the word I am is the Hebrew word Yahweh. And that word was so holy that before basically Christians started to translate the Bible, when it was just Jewish scripture and Jewish words and the Old Testament, that, that name, I Am, was so sacred and holy that they, did, they wrote it without consonants, Y-H-W-H. And the reason they wrote it without consonants is because it was so holy, they didn't want anybody to be able to pronounce it. And so until Christianity came along, and translation of Hebrew into Latin and then into English and so forth. And, of course, the Christian view that he's our father and that we're his children and we're the bride of Christ. In other words, we have a relationship with God, so we don't, we don't need to treat God as if he's uh, so holy we can't even say his name. So we then put some vowels with those consonants, and we put Y-A-H, W E H and it's pronounced Yahweh. And so hallelujah is a combination of halal, which means to dance a jig, and to Yah, which means is, is to the I am God. So hallelujah means to dance a jig before the Lord in praise to him. So the word, and, and alleluia is the Greek form of hallelujah in the, in the Hebrew. And this is the only place it's mentioned, but it's mentioned four times in this chapter. And everybody gets happy about it. So he said, and I heard these, a loud, a loud voice of great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. So this is just really an exclamation of the fact that, um, that these tribulation believers who've suffered under the Antichrist, who've been martyred, beheaded, killed for their faith in Christ and faith in Jesus, that uh, they're, they're celebrating this. It, 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 it's a great time for them. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Of course, you remember the great harlot. Um, the great harlot is the church side of the Antichrist. The Antichrist has two sides. He has a political side, and he has a religious side. And you remember we saw in chapter 17, we saw the religious side get judged and torn up. And then in chapter 18, we saw the political side get judged and torn up. The great city that fell. You remember, and it's talked about now, it's become the habitation of demons and spirits and all manner of evil things and birds, <laughs> caged birds and evil cage. <laughs> That's still kind of funny when you think about it. Uh, out of all the things that, that John could have mentioned, he has, you know, he talks about birds and uh, I'm thinking, boy, he had some problems with some birds. I know he did on, a, on that Isle of Patmos, you know, out there. The Isle of Patmos is just a little rock sitting out in the Mediterranean. It's pretty, it's not, it's not a long way from shore. I think it's about something like about 35 miles from the shoreline. So it's not out in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's a long way, you know. I mean, you're not going, you're not going to swim, I don't think. How long can you trip? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good question. How long can you? And uh, but anyway, and it's just a volcanic rock. I mean, it's really um, uh, the, the greenery. I mean, it's just really not a pleasant place to be. Obviously, it was a prison island. It was there for punishment and torture and so forth. But 
Yeah, a lot of birds, a lot of birds out there. But uh, <laughs> John said, yeah, John said in the birds. But anyway, the point is the, the great harlot is the, is the religion of the Antichrist, the prostitute, the, the one who pretends to be right and righteous but basically is uh, selling itself out. It's what it pretty much boils down to for uh, control and power. And the, the, the harlot, remember, she sat on the beast, which meant, okay, she, uh, you would think that she would be in control, but, of course, she thinks she controls the beast, but the beast really controls her. That's what it pretty much boils down to. But it does say that she receives her power from the beast. I mean, um, and... And, that, and that's true because she is given authority to kill the Christians and to do the commerce and to uh, do anything basically that she wants to because the beast gives her the power and the authority to do that. So she's judged in chapter 17 and just uh, mutilated there. And so they're, they're rejoicing and they're saying, you know, God's done a great thing because uh, she's gotten her comeuppance and... It's a terrible thing for her. Verse 3, again, they say, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever, which is not talking about the fact that she, the city burns forever and ever or she burns forever and ever, but it's talking about the, the fact that, um, that her judgment continues forever and ever. I mean, that's just really a good, uh, that's a way of saying um, that her destruction and the, those that, uh, follow her and those that did her bidding and all of those things that they really um, they receive their judgment forever and ever and it never ceases in verse 4 and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down now you remember the 24 elders we we got introduced to those guys in the chapter 4 and the the angels that flew around the throne the four living creatures that flew around the throne chapter 4 the 24 elders represented all of the church age believers who have been raptured and have received their rewards. They're sitting on thrones. They have crowns on their heads, not diadems like a king would wear, but they have the victor's crown on their head like an Olympic champion. So they've already received their crowns is what I'm saying. And in chapter four, they are seated next to the throne of God and then we've seen them all the way from chapter 4 till right now. At various times, you've seen them rejoicing or you've seen them involved in the activity that's going on uh, over those periods of years. And, and, and there they are. There, there, there we are. Uh, if you want to know who the elders represent, it's us. It's the church age believers. It's not the martyrs. It's not the tribulation saints. It's not the people that come to the Lord in the tribulation period because they're already in heaven when John gets there. You remember in chapter 4, John, the first verse, the Lord says, come up here and I'll show you great and mighty things which, which shall come to pass. And so when John gets there, he starts describing what he sees and he says, man, I see 24 thrones with 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones and I see four living creatures flying around the throne. They have a face like a man. They have a face like a calf. You know, they have a face like an eagle. They have a face like a lion. And, and they're flying around the throne uh, praising and rejoicing. And, and Now, that we saw them in chapter 4 and we've seen them all the way through. This is the last time you see them right here. They, they won't make another appearance in the book. But they're flying around and, and they worship God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Amen is another word, by the way, which is a, <laughs> a word for us. Uh, it means uh, so be it is really what it means. You know, it, it, it's become a word that people use to express themselves uh, in messages or at prayer, uh, at the end of prayer, uh, at certain points to, 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 to lend their agreement to say, I agree, yes, amen, so be it, uh, good, yeah. And so here are the 24 elders and the beast, and I mean the, the living creatures, and they're flying, and they're all excited about what's happening. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. So that's just proclaiming that uh, 
that, that God is uh, to be worshiped and served. It's really, you can see, a celebration. And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. If that little phrase right there sounds a little familiar, if you've ever listened to the Messiah, Handel's Messiah, that phrase is one of the phrases that's used in there over and over again. Uh, matter of fact, several of the phrases in the book of Revelation you probably have heard in Handel's and, and the Messiah and, and the, whole, um, the whole work there that's done. But these are guys that are saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. I say thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there a word that covers? <laughs> covers our our thank expression you, of you, of uh, thank you for all of thanks thank for. Yeah, thank you just doesn't seem to be enough, does it? Yeah, yeah. Well, just say hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just say hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Uh, if it was a word big enough, we probably would be able to say it anyway. Well, you know, I mean, that, that song, uh, the song that Andre Crouch wrote that, that we probably all know, uh, How Can I Say Thanks for the Things That You've Done for Me, Things So Undeserved, Yet You, yet you Did to Prove Your Love for Me, The Voices of a Million Angels Could Not Express My Gratitude, Yet All I Am and All I Ever Hope to Be. I owe it all to you. And uh, that's a good expression. I mean, there, there's another great person of the Lord trying to express the fact, how can I say thanks? I mean, how, what's big enough? What's big enough? The voices of a, of a million angels couldn't express my gratitude. I love that. Yet all I am, and I love that other line, the next line, and ever hope to be, I owe it all to you. I would all to thee, you know, to God be the glory. Uh, so anyway, that's what you have going on here. You have a, a whole multitude. Now, this is most likely the whole group that's in heaven. Now, let's think about this just one second because we really probably don't think about this. In heaven now, right here at the end, there are a lot of different groups up there. There's, okay, there's the, the church because we've been raptured out. There's the uh, Old Testament saints who have now received their inheritance and reward because, remember, they, they're not part of the church. The Old Testament saints are not part of the church because they, they, uh, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. So in other words, Ab Abraham was saved or made a friend of God and then he was called the friend of God by believing that what God said was what was going to happen. Not, and we were saved by looking at what God said has happened. So by faith, we have been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the church is a group of people that started at Acts chapter 2 and ended when the church got taken to heaven at the rapture. Everything in between, in between Acts 2 and the rapture is the church. The Old Testament saints are the Old Testament saints who have been counted righteous because they believed God when he said, I'm sending a Messiah. The Messiah is going to save the world and Here's what I want you to do, and they did it. It, it. Hebrews chapter 11 is filled with those people. It said, it says of them in, in, in chapter 11. As a matter of fact, I think one of the things that I'm going to do after the start of the year is I'm going to take those people that are mentioned in Acts 2 and just have a message on each one of them and just show you what, what it is about them that, that landed them in the hall of fame of faith, which is that chapter 11. Yeah, Rick, what'd you have? I think it's worth noting that. <clears throat> Right. Always called to do. They were not saved by any of that. No. They were saved by trusting in God. All those, all those sacrifices of spotless lambs, right, and, and pure animals. That was all pointing to the sacrifice, right. that God was going to give. Yep. In His Son. That was all. And, and there, 
Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They they just believed uh, what Rick was saying, and I'm gonna just interpret it for anybody that might be listening. Is that uh, the Old Testament saints, when they made these sacrifices, that they weren't saved by the sacrifices, that they were saved because they believed God, and by faith they they exhibited faith in what God was going to do in the future. Uh, and just like we're saved by what God did, by believing what God did in the past. I mean, none of us were alive when Jesus was on the earth. So everything that about Jesus and faith and belief and trust is in our past. Well, we're saved by looking at the past and believing. They were saved by looking for something that hadn't happened yet, by believing that it was going to happen in the future. And all of those sacrifices that they did uh, just postponed the judgment of God. That, I mean, this was true with Israel. Uh, every year they had to do these sacrifices, like, like the, sacri- the, the, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement happened on a day every year where all of Israel had to come before God, and they did it by, by families. Like, if I, if I'm the, if I am the, the patriarch of my family, if I'm, the, if I'm the highest living person in my family, then all of the rest of the family come to me, and they confess their sins. And then I take a spotless lamb or an animal, bullock, lamb, and I sacrifice it. I get the blood in a basin. I go, to the, I go inside the tabernacle outer court. I go over to the brazen altar, the brass altar. And I, and I pour the blood that's in this basin that I have confessed all of my family's sins over. And I begin to pour it in that brass altar. And the smoke begins because it's filled with coals. And when that blood hits those coals, steam and smoke come off. It begins to rise. And, and, the, the, and the rabbis say this. Now, of course, I, we don't see it in the scripture. It doesn't describe what happens. But the rabbis say that, that if God received the offering, then it was as if God drew in a breath and the smoke went and, and was drawn to the nostrils of God. If it just kept going straight up, it meant God didn't receive it. That meant somebody lied. You left something out. And it meant that sacrifice was not accepted. And what that means is you got to get back out there to your family and get at the end of the line. It's all happened in one day. That's why it was called the Day of Atonement, not the Week of Atonement, the Day of Atonement. Everybody had to get through in the day. So you got kicked back. It meant you at the end of the line, you might not get another chance. But if you do get another chance, you better, not, you, you better be right this time. So you go back to your family and you say, all right, who lied? Who didn't tell the truth? Who left something out? Who didn't confess? Because God has not received our sacrifice. Now to show you how serious this is, if God did not receive the sacrifice and you did not get to make your atonement on that day, you were kicked out of the tribe, which means you can't travel with them anymore. And they're in the desert. So that means you're going to die. Is what that means. You and your family, you have no food, you have no water, you have no protection, you have nothing. Your history. That's how serious that was. And all that did was postpone the judgment of God until the next day of atonement, which happened next year. And every year, you had to sprinkle the blood, go through that process every year. And so all of the Jewish people of the Old Testament, and even now, uh, because they're still doing those sacrifices. I mean, I still, it's, they, they still are doing the same thing. And all of those sacrifices, like Rick mentioned, were intended to show them Christ. It was intended to give them a picture of salvation and the Messiah and the blood of the innocent shed for the guilty. And, and Christ fulfilled every single one of those feast days, holy days, 
He fulfilled every single bit of it, but they refused to see that. They, they, were, they were blind, yeah. So they still make sacrifices, and they're not saved by those sacrifices. They're, they're, not, they're, they're in hell at, like anybody who never even had one inkling about God because Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not one of many ways. I am the only way. And any Jewish person that is in heaven is saved just like you and I are saved by faith in Christ, either looking forward to Christ coming and believing God or looking back to it. Or at the end, being alive when Christ comes and saying, how could we have been so blind all of these years? And they look at Christ according to the book of Zechariah and say, where would you get those wounds? And he said, in the house of my friends. And they fell down and began to throw ashes and, sackcloth and put on sackcloth. And it says, and a fountain for the forgiveness of sin was opened up in Jerusalem. So, in other words, the, the ones who are alive at the end are going to recognize that Christ is their Messiah. And they're going to receive him just like we receive him. And they are going to be saved. But now that's if they make it through <laughs> the tribulation, which is, a, as you can tell, is a very iffy proposition. But so when the whole multitude here is rejoicing and saying hallelujah and it sounds like thunder and it's wrong, this is everybody that's in heaven. This is the church. It's the Old Testament believers who now have been taken on and, and been there. This is the people who have died during the tribulation period, the martyrs. These are the Jewish people who have recognized at the end when Christ came down to fight the battle of Armageddon and so forth that he is actually their Messiah and they have received him. So this is the whole multitude. This is everybody. This is people that are that have, I mean, really think about it. In the millennial kingdom, and we'll look at it in just a minute, it's in these passages, uh, there are going to be some people that live on earth who have not died. Right. I mean, they're going to be, they're alive in human bodies. They're people living during the tribulation period. A lot of them are going to be killed if they have faith in Christ, but not all of them. Some of them will escape. You have 144,000 Apostle Pauls, basically, that preached the gospel during the tribulation period. You had the two witnesses that, that preached the gospel everywhere they went. And they, and they won some people to the Lord. And those people are still alive. And they have human bodies, just like us. And during the millennium, they're going to go into the millennium with a human body. So which me, right. Those aren't resurrection no, they're... Well, we'll have, these, are, these are bodies that are going to die. Yeah, that's exactly right. These are, yeah, these are bodies, flesh and blood. And those people are going to have babies in the kingdom. Because they can, I mean, they're human. They're, I mean, we're not going to be able to have any because we're spirit. You know, we're, we're, a, a, we're, we're in our new bodies, our resurrected bodies. The martyrs that have been martyred and have been under the altar in heaven crying out, how long is it going to be before you avenge our blood? They're going to have resurrected bodies. The Old Testament saints are going to have resurrected bodies. But some of the people there are going to have human bodies, flesh and blood. And they're going to go through the millennium, and they're going to be able to have families and children. They're going to be marrying and giving in marriage. They're going to be going through life as usual. They're going to, you know, they're, I don't know whether they'll live for, for a thousand years or whether they'll live for 700 years or I, I don't know. It doesn't say how long they're going to live, but they're going to live during the millennium, most likely. And I mean, that's just my thought. Most likely, I think they'll live the whole time. I think they'll, if you're alive as a human without, with, not in a resurrected body, but a, a flesh and blood human body, and you go into the millennial kingdom, that you'll live the whole thousand years in that, in that body. It's just my thought. And you'll have babies, and they'll have families, and then they'll have families, and you'll have grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and great-great-great-grandchildren, and all of that. that. That's everybody. I mean, that's the collection of people that we're talking about here now, and this whole multitude, and they're saying... God's omnipotent, which means, omnipotent means all-powerful. Omnipotent. Uh, omni meaning all and potent meaning power. So they're saying God is all-powerful. There's nothing greater than God. Our God reigns. All right, now, here we come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. How many of you have ever heard of the marriage supper of the Lamb? You've heard that phrase before? All right, <clears throat> this is where this comes from, and I'll, I'll make this kind of brief. Uh, at, at, the Jewish wedding ceremony is a very unique thing. 
the, and the ceremony reflects uh, everything to do with Christ, as everything else Jewish does. I mean, really, all of the feast days, holy days, uh, sacrifices, offerings, uh, everything that they're asked to do with their money and their time and their people and everything, all of it points to Christ. Every bit of it is about Jesus. It's just pictures and, 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 and symbols and, and instances that tell about Christ. Well, the, 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 the way the Jewish wedding is, is done, and I, I preach a whole message. I might do that in the future, too. I uh, hadn't done it in a long time. But to make it short, um, when, when, a, when, a, when a bride and a groom are betrothed, when they are engaged, uh, the groom goes back to build the wife a home because he can't just throw a piece of cardboard and, and marry her and take her out there. He's got to prepare for her. He's got to provide for her. So he goes back and builds a home, and that home is not um, acceptable until dad, who knows what it takes to have a family and what a family needs to live, goes out and inspects the home and says, okay, son, you can go get her. In other words, the boy can't go back and just halfway build some little shack and then go get her. He's, right. The, the dad comes in and dad says, okay, go get her. This is why Jesus said, no one knows when I'm coming back. I don't even know when I'm coming back. The angels don't know. I don't know. Only my father knows because dad's the one that's got to say, all right, it's finished. Because you remember what Jesus said in John 14? Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and, and when I get that place ready, I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you might be also. And so Jesus is, we're betrothed. We're, we're, we're promised. We're the bride of Christ. He's going to come back. He's the heavenly bridegroom. We're the bride. The church is the bride. Not the Old Testament saints, not the martyred saints, not the tribulation people. The church is the bride of Christ. We're the only one who's going to be married to Jesus. Uh, you'll, I'll show you in a minute. But when he comes back and gets us, then he carries us away. We have the ceremony, the marriage. And then after that, they have a big supper, a big feast. And it's called, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all of the bride's friends, all of the acquaintances, everybody that's happy for them are invited to this marriage supper and so the bride is there, the bridegroom is there, honored guests are there, happy people are there for them, uh, and it is a feast, and it's a celebration that the marriage has happened. The, the bridegroom has been faithful to his word. The bride has been faithful to her word. They have married each other. They fulfill their commitment to each other. And now they have the rest of their life together, and we're their friends, and we are happy for them, and we are excited about this. And that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, of course, we're the bride of Christ. Jesus is the heavenly bridegroom. When we get to heaven, there's going to be a marriage, and there then will be a marriage supper after the marriage. Now, notice it starts talking about this. All right. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Okay, so here he's talking about, okay, we, we, we're having a wedding and, a, and after the wedding we're going to have a feast. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. So you don't even have to try to interpret that. Um, then he said to me, right. I guess John must have been standing there like, with his mouth open or something, and he's not writing anything, you know, he's just, you know, he said, hey, hey, write, write. Now, there's an angel. This is an angel who's carrying him around. Uh, you'll see that in just a minute, but it, it, it's one of God's messenger angels. It might be Gabriel, I don't know. Gabriel seems to be the messenger angel that gives people news and so forth. Uh, he was the one that spoke to Mary and told her she was highly favored with God and so forth. Um, and call his name Jesus and all of that. But anyway, so this angel, John says, this angel says, hey, man, write, okay? And write this, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true, these, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet. John gets kind of temporarily overcome here, evidently, with excitement. And he falls down at the feet to worship this angel. 
But the angel said to me, <laughs> see that you don't, do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So John is up and the, and the marriage is going on and John is evidently so captivated and spellbound and overwhelmed with everything that's happening. And the angel says, hey, write this stuff. This is, God wants the people to know. This is true. And then he falls down and he starts, oh, yes, you know, and oh, worship. And the angel says, get, what, what? Get up from there. <laughs> Jesus is the only one that deserves to be worshiped. I, don't worship me. I, I'm an angel. I mean, I'm a fellow servant. As a matter of fact, the word that she used is slave. It's the ancient the, the, it's, the, it's the most basic word that is used for slave. So the angel says, I'm, like, I'm a slave to God just like you're a slave to God. Don't, don't worship me. He said, because um, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now that sounds a little bit confusing, but, but what it is just basically saying is, look, there is a spirit in prophecy. Prophecy has a spirit. And by a spirit, I mean it has a purpose. It has a a meaning. It, it, it carries a spirit with it. And the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of the righteousness, the blessedness, the awesomeness of Jesus. So anytime there's prophecy spoken, it has one intent, and that is to magnify Jesus. So the angel says, look, don't worship me. Get excited about this because every prophetic word that has ever been spoken has only one intent, and that is to show you the awesomeness of Jesus. So we got the marriage supper going on, and the angel... Well, I don't know why this thing's getting so ticky. Um, let me go on. All right, here now, we're, now we see the entrance of the bridegroom. Here's Jesus. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. We've seen a white horse before, right? Remember, the Antichrist was riding a white horse, seal one. It, it's got a little bit different description here now. Notice this. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. The other one was not faithful and true, was he? He was a deceiver and a con man. So to distinguish this white horse rider, the Spirit says, by the way, just so you'll know his nature, his nature is faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Now, this is not crowns like Olympic people wear. This is diadems. This is the crown of a king. So if you, you know, a lot of people want to make the rider of the white horse when the first seal gets broken and the rider of the white horse here, which is obviously Jesus, be the same one. But they're, they're not the same at all. The only thing that's, the, that's similar is they're riding a white horse. And the white horse is always a sign of a conqueror. So here's, here's heaven's conqueror. This is not the fake one. This is not the, the phony uh, Antichrist, the one pretending to be a king. This is the real one. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. In other words, there's some mysterious name for Christ that we don't know yet. And it's such a, a deep name that we're, like Billy said a few moments ago, if, we, if there was another word for, how to, for thanks, thankfulness to God, we probably couldn't say it or w wouldn't be able to pronounce it. Well, this right here says that Jesus has a name that we can't even comprehend at this time, that only Jesus can comprehend. Now, when, we get, when we're standing right there, we're going to be able to comprehend that name because so, Corinthians says... So we can just rest easy and just say thank you. We can rest easy and say thank you. <laughs> we can rest easy and say, you know, we may not be able to say it now, but we'll be able to say it then because when we get there... Our abilities, our comprehensions, our uh, humanity will be gone, uh, righteousness, spiritual life. Uh, Corinthians says that we will know as we are known. For then we shall see him face to face, and we shall see him as, and we shall know as we are known. Which, how much does God know about us? He knows everything about us. So what he's saying is, when you get there and you're looking in my face, you're going to know everything I know. So there's not going to be any reason for you to say, hey, Jesus, what about, you know, because you're going to know it. Yeah, Rick, what? Verse 11, that's, that would actually be the 
actually be the second coming of Christ at the Battle of Armageddon when he actually sets his feet back on the earth. That is exactly right. That's verse 11. Right. Verse 11 is, is the literal second coming of Christ. And, and uh, I've, just, I don't know if some of the guys watching may have heard me say this, but just for, for clar clarity's sake, uh, we, we in the church many times use the word or phrase second coming of Christ to talk about the rapture when, when, when we're going to be taken by him. But that's not the second coming because the second coming is going to be a literal coming to earth. Everybody's going to see him. He's going to put his foot on earth just like he did the first time. And, and, he, and of course, that's going to be at the Battle of Armageddon. What happens to us is he comes in the clouds. If you read Thessalonians, it says that the Lord shall come in the clouds and we which are, are alive on earth shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He doesn't actually put his foot on the earth. He just comes up there and it's a secret coming because he says, behold, I come like a thief in the night. And the people know... If you're not called up by him, you're not going to know what happened. What ride that's going to be. Yeah, right. I mean, it's going to be, it's a secret coming, and this is the second coming. Uh, the people of earth are going to uh, wake up if it happens at night, you know, or realize if it happens in the day, uh, what happened to these people? Where have all these people gone? This is, you know, a mysterious thing. It said two shall be grinding at the mill, and one shall be taken, and one shall be left. Two shall be working in the field, and one shall be taken, and one shall be left. Uh, denoting uh, surprise. I mean, one's gone. All of a sudden, you're there working with somebody in the field, and you look over, and all of a, and they're gone. What? Well, this is the second coming. This happens boldly, uh, openly. Uh, everybody sees it. The whole world's captivated. And that's what Jesus looked like. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. Now, don't let that dipped in blood fool you, because most of us, when we see dipped in blood, we're thinking about the sacrificial blood of the Lamb. This is not the sacrificial blood of the Lamb. This is the blood of all those people that have come against him. This is judgmental blood here. He has his, I mean, he's got on a robe and it's got blood on it because the blood has run as deep as the horse's bridles. And this is, this is not merciful blood. This is not a merciful scene here. This is not the grace of God that's being shown here. This is the judgment of God, the justice of God. He's got eyes flaming fire. He's got, well, that's not the end of the description, look. And the, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Just to point out something, yeah. <laughs> Just can point out I, something. Can I have a white Harley? Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, you can get two of them, one for each hand, man. Uh, but notice that the armies of heaven are dressed just like the bride. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And notice something else. They don't have any weapons. So they're clothed just like the bride, and they don't have any weapons. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. That's the only weapon he has. Of course, it's the only one he's going to need, you know, because the enemy's going to be wiped out with just a word from his mouth. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So this is describing uh, a, a, ju a judgment scene. It, it is that... The earth has rebelled. The earth has uh, fought against him. The armies of the earth have come against him to try to destroy him and conquer him. Uh, that's really what the Battle of Armageddon is all about, is, is, is to fight against the Lamb. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's to try to overtake the Lamb. It's to try to de defeat the Lamb. And the Bible says that ain't happening. You know, they don't have a prayer. Uh, he, we don't even have any weapons. We're with him, but we don't have any weapons because we don't need any. Uh, and, and he has a sharp sword, which is a wor the word that goes out of his mouth, you know, uh, be gone or bye or uh, see you or whatever it might be. And, uh, and, 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 it's, and, and the picture is like, it's, the picture is that God is, 
is pressing the en- his enemies like, like you would step into a wine vat and press out the grapes. You just... That's when the blood runs up, to the up to the horse's bridle. That's exactly right. That, that is the Battle of Armageddon. <laughs> it's not even a good skirmish, is it? And he has on his robe and on his thigh, because the thigh is a picture of strength, uh, big muscle. Uh, he has his name, has a robe, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Buddy, that is majestic. Here comes the battle now. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. So they're going to have a feast too. All the buzzards and the and the carrion birds and the ravens and the and the and all of the birds of prey and all the birds what 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 are, what do they call the vultures and all of that uh, carrion, carrion yeah uh, that you may eat the flesh of kings yeah that you may eat the flesh of kings the flesh of captains the flesh of mighty men the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both great and small. Just pointing out the fact that everybody's going to be in, in for it. It's not just the leaders. It's not just the Antichrist. It's not just uh, the people that are leading everybody. It's a, he, this is a basically non-discriminatory judgment right here. Uh, everybody that has rejected him, everybody that has uh, cursed him, everybody that has uh, turned their back on him, everybody that has said no. And, and here's the thing, not only the great villains of all time and the great, uh, and the people who harm people, but, uh, and you'll see it in some passage uh, later on, but it says, and the unbelievers. I mean, just think about this, that there'll be some people that'll be in that bunch that'll be pressed and, 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 and will be annihilated um, that are just simply unbelievers. I mean, they're not like Hitler or murderers or some great uh, deceivers or anything that have hurt people and harmed people and done people wrong and tried to kill people and beheaded people. They're, they're not just those kind of people. Some people that are simply unbelievers. Just, that's their only crime is they're an unbeliever. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that is true. That's right. S- simply unbelievers. Yep. That's right. That's why. That's why our mandate and our message and our testimony is such a powerful thing. Because unless they believe, they'll be part of this bunch here. And I saw the beast. This is the Antichrist and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Now, let me just tell you about this for one second. Um, what's, what happens in preparation for the Battle of Armageddon is you have the Antichrist. His, his political seat is in Jerusalem. I mean, he, he has set himself a throne in the temple of God. Paul says it in Thessalonians. He sets himself up on a throne in the temple of God, showing that he is God. So he actually has a physical presence in the city of Jerusalem on a throne that is in the temple of God that has been rebuilt by the Jewish people. And he also has a religious city in Rome where all of his uh, religious activities come out. And then he has a financial center that is most likely in, in some, it's either in the city of Rome or maybe a Western capital like we were talking about like New York City or some place that has financial uh, control and interest. So that, that, that's his kingdom. That's his kingdom. Now, over here, east of the Euphrates River, which is the old uh, boundary of the old Roman Empire, and it is the boundary of the Antichrist kingdom. Over here, east of the Euphrates River, are the armies of the east. And the armies of the east are China, Japan, Korea, uh, Indonesia, India. It's those eastern, that eastern bunch. All right, they have been 
practically n- n- not involved with the Antichrist. They haven't, they haven't been bothered by the Antichrist. He has taken over the Western world, the old revived Roman Empire. So it's the Western world. It, it, it's, the, it's Europe. It's, uh, it's, the upper, it's the Middle East and Europe. And then any nations that have been associated with the old Roman Empire, like us, Canada, Australia, uh, the Western world. So it's the Western world that is under the control of the Antichrist. The Eastern, the Far East is not under the control. I mean, they, they haven't had any dealings with him. They've just been, they just hear about him. They just hear about what he's doing, what's happening, and so forth. It, the Battle of Armageddon is when those armies of the East are drawn by God to fight against the Antichrist. They're coming, they're coming with the intent of, of fighting the Antichrist. The Euphrates River's dried up. You know, we've read about that. So that the armies of the East, the two million man army that's mentioned in Revelation, comes across and comes to fight a battle. Well, they're coming to fight the battle against the Antichrist. But when they get there, the Antichrist, as seductive as he is and as manipulative as he is, and remember, by the time they come, which is at the end of everything, uh, he has been transformed. He has, been, uh, he has become the incarnation of Satan himself. You remember he had the deadly wound, and then he went into the abyss, and then he came up out of the abyss, and he was a whole different character when he came out of the abyss than he was when he went in. When he went in, he was the Antichrist. He was deceptive. He was cunning. But he was, he was suave and debonair and, uh, and smooth and attractive and, and, and polite and kind. And he just ruled, he, he took over the world by manipulation. But when he, when he gets that head wound that is deadly and he goes down into the abyss, when he comes back out, he's filled, he's filled with the devil. He is the incarnation of Satan himself. And then that's when he starts trying to kill the Jews and he becomes the murderer of the world and he has all out assault against God. Well, the kings of the East are hearing all this stuff. And so they begin to think, man, we better get up there and deal with this cat or he's going to come take us over. So they form their armies and they come across the Euphrates and they're coming, they're headed to Jerusalem to fight the Antichrist. Not God, the Antichrist. But when they get there, the Antichrist is so deceptive and cunning that he manipulates them into becoming part of his armies that are going to fight against God. And so that's what happens here. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So the first thing Jesus does is he, he grabs the Antichrist and he grabs the false prophet and he casts them. He doesn't annihilate them. He alive, cast them down into the lake that's burning with sulfur, which is called the lake of fire. So those two are cast down in there, but notice who's not there. Satan is not there. He just got those two, and boom, they're cast down into the lake that's burning with fire and brimstone. And the reason the devil's not there is because God's got something else for him to do before he puts him there. In verse 21, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's the battle of Armageddon and that's what's going on. All right, now, for chapter 20. Is this, Tan, you got chapter 20 loaded? The millennial kingdom? Yeah, all right, here we go. Satan is bound for a thousand years. All right, here's what happens when, the, when that battle is over. All of the rest of the people are killed. The blood's running into the deepest horse's bridle. All the buzzards and, and birds of prey and everything come and start eating up the bodies and all that kind of stuff. All right. 
Here's what, here's what Jesus does then. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, the last time we saw the key to the bottomless pit, uh, an angel had it, or the devil had it. You remember? And, there, and, he, and he used it to open up the abyss, and out of the abyss, this is the fifth trumpet, came this uh, army of demon locusts, remember? So the last time we saw that key, the devil had it. But now God's got it, and an angel has it. And the angel comes down with it, and he, and, and he opens the, the abyss, and, and he's got this chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, in case you wonder who that is, that, old, that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So, Satan has now been bound, and the abyss has been opened, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Now, this is not the lake of fire. This is the abyss. So, Satan is not yet in the lake of fire. The false prophet and the Antichrist are in the lake of fire. Satan, the abyss has been opened, where he came from to start with, and and, and the angel has bound him with a chain, thrown him back down into the abyss, and has chained him there for a thousand years. So he's not going to be able to influence, he's not going to be able to have any sway over anything for a thousand years, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So the reason that Jesus has not thrown him into the lake of fire yet is because he's got another project for him. After a thousand years, Satan is going to be loosed for a little season. Now, you might wonder why that would be. And the only thing the scripture indicates as to why that would be is that during the millennium, during the thousand years, there are going to be people on earth that are human flesh and blood. Those flesh and blood people are going to have flesh and blood babies. And they're going to be a whole generation of people born on this earth who need Christ, who must receive Christ, just like us, but who have never faced temptation, have never had an enemy to face. So they've lived for a thousand years in peace, harmony, uh, joy, uh, no war, no death, no sorrow, no sin, no rebellion, perfect life. Jesus is sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, ruling over his kingdom. All of us who have been faithful over a few things, he's going to make ruler over many. Many of us will be ruling certain sections of the world during the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, and, and, and at the end you know, the people that have been born are going to have to be confronted with the same uh, force we've been confronted with, and they're going to have to make a choice as to whether they're going to receive Christ or not. So God has Satan bound up for a thousand years so that he has no influence, he has no, uh, no dealing with people, but after a thousand years, he's going to be loose for a little while so that he can tempt and seduce and whatever all of these people that have been born so that they have the same opportunity that we've had to either say yes to Christ or no to Christ. So Satan's not in the lake yet. All right. Saints reign for a thousand years. And I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Uh, by the way, that, mean, that, that word judgment there doesn't mean we're, we're, we're going to be able to judge people's lives like whether they're evil or not evil or righteous or not right. This is judgment like the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, we, the church, who have already been through the judgment seat of Christ, we've already received our rewards. Remember the 24 elders, they have the crowns. They have like the, okay, the crown of life, the crown of rejoicing, the soul winner's crown, the martyr's crown. Whatever crowns they've earned at the judgment seat of Christ, they have them. Well, now those that have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ are now going to be given the position to judge the tribulation believers, the ones who have 
been saved after tribulation started, and some of them have been martyred, and some of them have been killed, and some of them. So now they're going to come before us because, remember, it says, he who's been faithful over a few things, I'll make him ruler over many, and the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Uh, this is when this happens. And so now we're given the authority by God to give out crowns to these tribulation believers who now have come to Christ, but they haven't received their crown because they weren't even there when we got our crowns. So anyway, so judgment was committed to, to them, to us. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark in their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So... Now the tribulation believers, and, and I think it's kind of interesting that he uses, uh, he, he talks about the way they were killed. I, I think this really kind of indicates something to us when he says, and all those who were beheaded for Christ, as if beheading is most likely going to be the, the typical way that the Antichrist kills those people. Uh, that's going to be the dominant way, you know, public execution, behead, blah, blah. We've already seen some of that kind of stuff, I think, haven't we? We've seen some warm-up to that, right? Yeah, we got a whole bunch of people to do that now. But the rest of the dead, now, the rest of the dead are the people who did not receive Christ. The rest of the dead is talking about everybody whose name is not written in the book of life. All the people that have been talked about up until this point are the people who have been raptured, who have trusted Christ during the tribulation, who have been martyrs during the tribulation, and they, they are in relationship to Christ. They're saved. Now, the rest of the dead are people who do not know the Lord, and they have been held in Hades, which the Bible calls Hades, Hades is one of the words that's used. And it's basically, if you want to get a concept of Hades, right now, what happens to lost people when they die they go to a place called Hades. The Bible uses the word Hades, and it means a holding cell. It, it's a place of torment. It's a place of, of pain, suffering, torment. But it's not the final place. The final place is the lake of fire called Gehenna. Hades is like a holding cell. In other words, it would be like the county jail before you get sent to the big house. So right now, all lost people are sitting in the county jail waiting for their sentence to be carried out at the big house. This is the big house. The big house is the great white throne. And so right now, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. All right, what he's saying here is that there are two resurrections. The first resurrection is not necessarily talking about the first in order because there have been, there have been resurrections before this. Lazarus was resurrected. You know, Jesus was resurrected. And, but anyway, go ahead, Rick. It's going to sound argumentative. Ah. But <laughs> Lazarus, that was not a resurrection. That was a resuscitation because he died again. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> You're making my point. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You're making my point. The first resurrection does not is not referring to the first one that ever happened. It's is talking about the first of its kind. It's talking about when the people that have been resurrected in this resurrection, all, all the people that have been killed, all the martyrs that have died, uh, all the ones that have been beheaded for the cause of Christ and given their life to the Lord. They get resurrected unto life. In other words, they get resurrected. This first resurrection is the first of its kind. The first of its kind means this is, this is, these are the first people that get resurrected who will never die again. Everybody else has had a resurrection that they resurrected, but they died again. I mean, Lazarus, he didn't stay alive forever. You know, he, right, he, he died again. And so, and, and, uh, and uh, the bones that, uh, that the prophet Elijah, 
you know, and the, and the guy that was dead, and they threw his bones down in the ditch, and he happened to hit the bones of Elijah, and then he came back to life, you know. Uh, resurrections, not the first one that's ever happened, but the first of its kind in that these people are resurrected never to die again. The second death is the ones who are resurrected, and then they're going to stand before the great white throne, and they're going to face spiritual death. So just, just kind of what these words we're talking about here, give you a little indication. Uh, uh, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the first resurrection is where you want to be. The first resurrection are those who are going to be resurrected who will never die again, as opposed to the second, which means, which is the ones that are going to stand before God and be spiritually dead forever. Now, when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went, up on the, uh, they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. All right, what this is saying is when s these people that have lived on earth for a thousand years and they have never seen war, they've never seen uh, death, they've never seen sorrow, they, the lion has laid down with the lamb and both of them have gotten up. The child plays with the serpent and doesn't, he doesn't die. Uh, everything is at perfect harmony. It's a perfect world for a thousand years. People are born. The earth repopulates. I mean, remember during the, all the seals and all the trumpets and all the vials, hey, this place is, I mean, they're, they're burn up very few people. I mean, uh, if, if eight bill, if, let's just say eight, seven bill, right now the population of the earth is about seven billion. Well, let's just say that when the rapture happens, we're going to be, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be um, um, gracious in this number. But let's just say a billion people get raptured. All right, that leaves six billion people on the earth. Well, during the seals, about a quarter of them are killed. During the trumpets, about another two quarter, uh, about another half. So now you only got about a third of the people that actually were alive when, after the rapture, are still alive on the earth by the time you get to the vials being poured out. And by the time you get to the end of the vials, I mean, it's probably down in the, in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, people who actually are alive on this earth, human beings, flesh and blood, that are alive on this earth. So during the thousands, right, yeah, right. And they got cancer and everything else. And, and see, then the millennium comes in, and for a thousand years, boy, you've got paradise. And strength, you've got no sickness, no sorrow, no disease, no death, no dying, no anything. Childbirth's easy, no pains, no, I mean, it's just, it's a paradise. And then at the end of a thousand years, Satan gets released from his abyss. The chains get taken off, unlocked, all right, out. And it takes him about a half of a millisecond to be back to, to his old trick. And he goes out. And he begins to deceive people. And he begins to do the same old tricks that he did to us. And he gathers a group of people that have been convinced that they can fight against God and that God has been evil and God needs to be taken care of. And he brings these people to a place just like he brought the kings of the east and just like he brought the armies of the earth to, to Jerusalem to fight against the Lamb. Well, the Lamb is sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, and he brings these people to try to destroy the Lamb of God, which is the city of Jerusalem. And as soon as he does, fire comes down out of heaven and <clears throat> consumes them all. But Satan is not burnt up in the fire. Notice what happens. The devil who deceived them didn't get burnt up in the fire that devoured all those people that were coming against God, that had been deceived and and thought they could, you know, the devil had tricked them into thinking they could, de they could defeat God. 
The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The great white throne. We, we just about finished. Y'all hang on one second. Then I saw a great white throne. All right, so, so far, the beast, the Antichrist, and, I mean, the, 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 the Antichrist, the false prophet, and now the devil are all in the lake of fire. Uh, they'll never be out. They're, they're gone. So now what happens? Well, now all the dead who didn't know the Lord, who've never received Christ, uh, are called before God. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. I mean, the, the awesomeness of the throne of God is so intense that the, that, that, that the earth is described as, as, as moving back, as, as fleeing away. And there, was no, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Now, this is the spiritually dead. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And so the dead, the spiritually dead, are going to stand before God. These are lost people. There's not a saved person standing before the great white throne. Everybody that stands before the great white throne is lost, and they're going to be judged out of two, out of two books. Well, one are called the books, so there may be multiple books, but then the other book is the book of life. Notice what it says. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. So every lost person, you, you know, I, I've, I've thought about this. Of course, I have no answer, and it wouldn't matter if I thought I did have one, but... You know, you, you, people who study anatomy and especially uh, brain activity and so forth tell us that we really never really forget things, that they're, 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 they're in there. Their, their memories are there. Everything is there. And it just takes the right trigger to pull these things out. And I, just thinking about this, you know, I'm thinking, all right, What's going to happen to all the lost people is they're going to be called one by one into the presence of God. And some books are going to be opened which have written in them the things that these people have done in their lifetime. And, and, and all of those things that they have done in their lifetime are going to be revealed to them in the presence of the, of the holy majesty, awesome purity of God. And... And, and I'm just, I'm thinking, how, what, what would those, what, what kind of books, what, what would that be like? And I'm, I'm just thinking, man, you know, Lord, stand there in the presence of God. God might just open our, open, not our, but because I'm not being there, but, but open the thoughts. And all of a sudden, you know, people that, people that have near-death experiences or they, they say things like, man, my whole life flashed before my eyes. And, and I'm thinking, okay, at the great white throne, God's going to, to take that memory off and, and all of a sudden everything that that person has done in their entire life is going to be flashed before their eyes and they're going to, they're going to see themselves as they really are. And I believe, honestly, that they're going, to, they're going to agree with God that they deserve to be, to be judged. They're going to bow their knee, their tongue's going to confess that Jesus is Lord and they're going to be judged. And, and by the things that are written there, and the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if your name's not in the book of life, you... You're going to be standing there, and you're going to be cast in the lake of fire. And your, your works are going to convince you that you do. I think, I think that the lost will be basically saying to God, I deserve it. You're right, God. You're right. They see themselves. They see their life. They see their works. They see their names not in the book of life. And 
And it's going to be, they're going to bow their knee. Because, you know, the scripture says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They'll confess, but it'll be too late. Yeah, Rick, you had a word. Do you think that depending on how, you know, these, these deeds that they're being judged by, right. some people are worse than others. Way worse. And, and some of us believers will do right. more with what we've been given than other believers. Right. Do you think that there will be varying levels of reward and varying levels of punishment for the law? I do. I, I do. Too. I do. I right, and and the only implication that that I, where I would get a conclusion like that from for me would be when I see that the books were open that have the, their lives written in them, and they were judged according to those things that were written in the books. That to me says degrees of punishment. It says if you had a lot of terrible things written in the books, then you're punishment would be terrible. Now, it's all going to be punishment, and it's all going to be separation from God. Right, and nobody's going to, going to like it, you know. But I think, I think that uh, if, you have, if you have very few things that are written in those books, that your punishment is not going to be as heavy as somebody whose book is, you know, an encyclopedia of evil. And, um, and, and, and because God is just. Yeah, God is just. And Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, in Corinthians, you know, of what every man shall be judged, uh, every man's works shall be judged of what sort it is. And, and that, that's okay. Uh, God gave me a lot of tools. And so uh, unto whom much is given, much is required. So if God gave me lots of tools, then I'm going to be held accountable for what I did with lots of tools. If I have few tools, which I think they're going to be tremendous rewards with people that we, 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 don't, eat, we don't know. They, they didn't, they, we don't know their name. They're not on TV. They're not leading big movements. But they have been faithful and gracious to God, and God has used them in many ways to win people to himself, and they've been tremendously influential in the reality of real people's lives. And they're going to receive great rewards. And many who have had great tools and have used them, uh, probably not fully, uh, they, have, they have maybe pridefully used them, uh, vainfully used them. Uh, surely they've, they've done great things based on what the world would think about it. You know, they've built big movements and they've had lots of influence, but they've really not used their gifts for the Lord as totally as somebody who maybe had some little tiny ability, but they did, they used that. I'm, I'm thinking of somebody like David Ring is who I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, the alabaster. Yeah, yeah. Mary. Given what she had, and to me, I was thinking about, and without expectation. Right. She wasn't expecting for anything bad. No, that, and that's exactly right. She just. <clears throat> this, to me, ties in with that. Right. You do what you do with your money or whatever, not trying to buy your way or, or whatever. You just right. Do because you have it and you know where it came from. Right. And you're, and, you're, and you're using what God gave you to right. give back to Him. Uh, that's that's exactly right. And people who have very limited abilities or very uh, uh, scarce opportunities, uh, who who are an inspiration to others when they see them and they see their heart and their life and their joy, and in spite of all these things, may be some of the greatest recipients of gifts that we've ever seen. You know. And he and and under and and he who's been faithful over a few things, making ruler over many. I think we're going to be really surprised who 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 sets in high positions in the millennial kingdom, you know, uh, and who doesn't, uh, because of that of what sort it is, and the same thing with with the books. Uh, I think there'll be degrees. Nobody will want to be there. At all, period. I mean, it's not going to be like okay. It's going some of it's going to be okay, and the others going to be horrible. No, it's the lake of fire. It's the lake of sulfur. It's torments forever and ever. But 
the level I think will be, you know, will be, will be um, equal with the with the evil, so to speak. But uh, but uh, and and we'll see, you'll see in 21 and 22. That's the only two we have left. It'll talk about who's going to be there, and it got a, it has a list. And then the last thing on the list is and unbelievers, which, like I was saying, it's you know it, it's just amazing to think that somebody will be there that's just simply an unbeliever. I mean, the only crime they have is that they have not believed in Christ. And that's a horrible thing. To, I mean, that's terrible to think about. And so as we meet people and we encounter people and we interact with people, you know, we're looking for those unbelievers, those ones that could be one, that if they were given an opportunity, if they would were given the right word or the right witness or the right thought, they, they might they might be saved from that unbeliever deal and, uh, and come to Christ. So, I mean, no, no Christian, none of us, read any of this with with great joy that people are going to be punished or judged is terrible it's a terrible thing but it does it does tell us that god is just and that what god says he 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 comes through with and that we do have a great reward that's waiting a marriage supper of the lamb the bride of christ you, you know the joy of heaven and everything about it and um we look forward to that. Uh, we got the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem started in 21, 22. Uh, some great words from the Lord that will be encouraging for us. So we'll get those. Now, is it is it next Sunday we, we go over? So that we'll have a, a week between. We'll come back on the, what, ninth, and get these, get these last two chapters because I don't really want to hang them over till January. Do you? Okay. All right, very good. All right.